Government Miniconf at LCA. It's very exciting to, uh, to run this session and we've got some, um, a pretty good lineup for you. My name's Pia War. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I have had a long history with, this, uh, with the open source community in Australia and, um, and I currently work in the government, but I am not here under any of those particular hats. I'm just here as an open source, open data and open government geek to talk to you a little bit about what's happening with the state of, uh, a bit of a state of the nation about what's happening in open government uh, around Australia and the different jurisdictions. So I happen to work in this space, so I happen, you know, so I uh, keep an active, um, I guess, knowledge about what's, what's going on, so I'm hoping this will be useful to you. And if you have any other questions, then just please ask them as we go. Uh, there's plenty of, of time to catch up with the different speakers we're going to have today. Our lineup today, we've got um, uh, this, uh, I'm going to kick off with a bit of a state of the nation. And then we're going to have an excellent uh, workshop by Helen, who's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, how to find resources that you need from an open data perspective. Um, and then after lunch, we've got a couple of panels, one about open infrastructure, where we've got a few speakers in the room and a few speakers coming in remotely to talk about different types of uh, open infrastructure that help support uh, doing open government. Uh, and then we'll be talking about open communities and getting some people to talk a little bit about um, how uh, open communities can help with open government as well. And then later on in the afternoon, we're going to have uh, an opportunity for some lightning talks. So if any of you want to share, uh, you know, for five minutes or so or a few minutes, something that you're doing in this space that you think might be of interest to everyone else, that'd be really great. So have a think about anything that you want to share. Um, we'll have a, a short session for that. And then we're going to finish with something a little bit interesting, which will be a bit of a brainstorming discussion where as a group, you know, because the group that we have here are obviously very interested in this space, it'd be nice to have a bit of a discussion about what we think open government can look like in practical terms in 2014 and what we can actually practically achieve to make um, tangible improvements in this space. The idea of that is to write that up and of course the entire day is being recorded so this will be a, a useful uh, reference for a lot of people out there as well as the, the people that come along today. Um, but the idea of writing up that last session is so that decision makers in the different jurisdictions in Australia can uh, sort of get some of your thoughts about this space and uh, how that can feed into their uh, planning and work around uh, open government. So uh, I'll kick off um, a little bit about the state of the nation uh, in Australia in 2014 or in January 2014 at any rate. I guess I wanted to start by saying why would you be interested in this space? Obviously, if you've come along today, then you've got some interest at all. But I've had a few geeks actually ask me, well, why, why would I care about government? Why would I care about open government? So I thought I'd just kick off by um, sort of laying that argument out a little bit. So obviously, government is, uh, well, and it's not actually necessarily obvious. Government is the single most influential factor in your life. It affects almost every aspect of, of what you do, how you do it, uh, the rules that are around you, the laws around you how you drive, <laughs> how you engage, um, uh, everything from how, to, how garbage collected, is collected in your street right through to what um, you know, crypto technology you're legally allowed to use. So um, there's a huge influence um, on the tech and tech sector. Government is such a huge influence because it is the biggest purchaser and user of technology of any entity in Australia and indeed around the world arguably, but certainly in Australia. So how that influences the tech sector because um, what government chooses to buy and use ends up you know, having an impact on the market, having an impact on industry, having an impact on research and developer funding. Um, and, um, and so getting and, and helping get good, I guess, geek knowledge and geek expertise into government is really important to making sure and to helping encourage, I guess, a, um, a well-informed use of technology in government. Um, it exists. It, at least in practice or in principle and hopefully usually in practice to serve the public good, which is quite different from a lot of other entities that exist in the world. So, um, and because it is at least again in principle and usually in practice relatively answerable to systems, citizens, government ends up being a mechanism by which we can actually you know, help serve our society and do good things. Uh, there's many ways to engage. Uh, a lot of people think of government and they only think about politics. I have worked in a political office, but I am very strictly apolitical. I don't subscribe to any of the political parties per se, though I've researched them all and have a very good understanding of what they all uh, stand for and, um, and how that translates through to practical policy. Uh, and I made that my business to understand so that when someone says X, what does that actually mean? Um, but, um, but I've worked in both the uh, political sphere and now in the public sphere of the government. 
uh, because like any good systems administrator, which is my background, I want to understand all the system, all the moving parts, and where I can push my finger into levers and fix the config files, basically. Uh, so um, trying to understand how it all works and how, that, how we can improve it is, is um, I think, very important. Uh, particularly for um, us, uh, because we're kind of leading the, the charge and trying to make life a little bit better, uh, given that everything now relies on technology. And it's rapidly adapting. So government right now is uh, in a very different environment than it was even 10 years ago, but certainly for preceding 100 years or so in Australia and hundreds of years around the world, in that um, the expectations of citizens are quite different, the ways that our service is delivered is quite different. Um, the, uh, the, the technologies that government uses, and I mean, as we heard in Sulet's talk this morning, it can be used in all kinds of ways. But uh, technology is a little bit like cars in that, you know, it can be used for great good or great evil, depending on what your personal definition of those things is. But um, it's, it's about how we can use it, uh, I guess, to, to help improve things. So why? I think there's a lot of reasons. What is it? There's the executive, legislative and administrative arms of government, the first two being political, the third being the public service, and understanding how those things interrelate, I think, is very important. And there's a lot of things that affect you. So there's legislation, there's policies and programs, there's the public services that we all expect. People love to attack and trash government, but then at the same time want access to their Medicare, want access to public roads and, those, and, so, and transport and those kinds of things. So understanding what role government can constructively play for you, I think is kind of useful, um, and how it directly and indirectly shapes the market. Uh, so we're in exciting times, and this is part of what government's struggling with. Uh, in a lot of well, governments are struggling with is that a lot of the traditional bastions of society, along the traditional pillars upon which power structures and power relations have been developed for millennia, um, are not just um, changing, but rather than being centralised and centrally controlled, are being massively distributed. The ability to publish, the ability to communicate, <laughs> monitor and enforce um, a perspective, regardless of whether that perspective is legitimate or not, um, has now been massively distributed through technology to almost, well, to the third of the global population that's now online. And now with 3D printing coming along, we're starting to see the entire paradigm of, of property starting to be dramatically changed. That's kind of, it, it's posing a lot of challenges, but a lot of, uh, but it's also very exciting from a perspective of participatory democracy and those kinds of things. So. It's, um, it's rather a changing world and it's, it's quite exciting, but uh, it's even more important um, in these exciting times to, I guess, uh, step up a little bit and make sure that um, some good basic underlying principles are, are underpinning the direction. So what is open government? Traditionally, it's all about freedom of information, about public reporting, about anti-corruption stuff, and open government has been around forever. So the amount of people that I go to talk to about open government and they say, oh, but we already have freedom of information, the amount of departments that I've spoken to, both in federal and state governments, who have said, well, we already do open government because here's our annual report, and then they hand me a book. Um, and, and that is a completely legitimate perspective, but it doesn't reflect open government in a digital age. So government, open government has basically been extended by technology to encapsulate the concept of opening up more data and more transparency of reporting and information in a um, reusable format. So it's one thing to have a, a PDF of your annual report which has all the information in it, or indeed a PDF of the budget, which is a really good example. The federal budget has been published under Creative Commons attribution license for the last three, four years, um, and yet it's still only available as a PDF. And so people go and screen scrape it and create manipulable versions of the data, which is fantastic. And as a person who has to go and read those um, uh, portfolio budget statements, I can tell you it's a very exciting thing to get access to the raw data. But, um, but you know, Treasury have not yet um, uh, released that data as a, um, as a, you know, raw data format. So, um, but people can do a lot more stuff with raw data. You can analyse it, you can visualise it, you can do, you can mash it up with other data sets. It gets much more interesting and, and useful for, to value add and for accountability and all kinds of other things. So shared and open data is a big thing in this new technology Gov 2.0 era of open government. Participatory government, of course, you can start to actually have publicly developed policies and you can start to actually get people inputting into policies in a, in a more useful way. And not just to get lots and lots and lots of ideas from the general public, but also to start doing analysis around the themes that emerge, around the issues, around the experiences that can feed into better policy outcomes. And then you can start to contextualise that. If 80% of people thought that was a bad idea, but 100% of those people work for the same company, that's the sort of um, insights that can tell you how representative a particular perspective is. So it's actually harder to game consultations online than it is to game a town, traditional town hall consultation, which means we can actually get more representative and better policy outcomes. And citizen-centric services. The concept that 
rather, citizens don't care which department a service is delivered by or indeed which sphere of government and often don't know and don't care. So um, the ability to say, I just want to know what health services are available to me in every sphere of government is, is very important and something that citizens really value, but departments um, are very protective of you know, their branding, of their logos, of, their, um, uh, of the amount of hits they get on their website. So we've got to change that, that um, concept to be more about, okay, let's build um, services and information that can be aggregated according to a theme and according to the personalization of what people want. Um, that's going to take a lot of work, but that's certainly something that's starting to, uh, to infiltrate into, the, you know, in, into this space, which is really exciting. So the concept of open government has, has shifted quite dramatically with the proliferation of, of technologies we now have access to. Um, I've done a bit of work in trying to map out, <laughs> which I'm not going to go through this entire thing right now. Um, but, um, yeah, so don't worry. Um, but trying to map out what the policy landscape is and what the project's landscape is. And just to give you a, a brief idea, all of these things here, that's about 15 policies in the federal government that have anything to do with open government or open data. They encapsulate things like the Statement of Intellectual Property by the Attorney General's office from 2010, explicitly states in it that all federal government data and, and information should be released under a Creative Commons attribution license by default. Now, has it been enforced? Not really well. Has it been policed? Not particularly well. But as, a person, as the person who, with my other hat on, is actually running data.gov.au, when I can talk to departments <laughs> about releasing their data sets and I say to them, you will, of course, be using the Attorney General's default um, recommendation of um, Creative Commons by attribution, and they say, oh, yes, oh, yes, we'll definitely do that. If you, do if you turn around and say, which licence would you like to use, <laughs> then the lawyers get involved and then it takes another 12 months. So the policy landscape at the federal level is very complex at the moment. There's a lot of policies. This, by the way, this diagram is publicly available and you can click through to it, and I've got all these slides up on SlideShare, so you can click through to all of these policies and all of these things if, you, if you're interested. But then down the bottom here are all the policies that are related in the... Um, in the state and territory space that I know of. Uh, so, um, and it's quite interesting because open government or Gov 2.0, I guess in Australia at this point, in the states and territories and in the federal government has taken a very heavy lean towards um, data, open data or the use of data and services improvement. So improving how government actually does service delivery and online services, but I'll come, by that, come to that in a second. It's worth noting that um, the state, I. And it, this may be my lacking, so anyone in the crowd that knows any better or out there that knows any better, please let me know. But um, I've, apart from the really cool SLIP project in the Western Australian Government, which is all about publishing spatial data, uh, which is a fantastic project, um, I'm, I'm yet to find any key policies in the Western Australian Government around this space, but would, would love to hear about them if, if they're out there. But um, at this point, there's very, very strong um, uh, policy landscape in several of the states, and I'll go into that in a minute. Over here are all the open data projects that I know of, and they range from data portals in uh, five of the states and territories plus at the federal level. Um, it, they range through to a whole bunch of open research projects, science projects, um, administrative data projects. There's a bunch of community initiatives around this space. There's a bunch of standards that have been developing for, in some cases for many years, in some cases for a very short period of time. And there's even a, a bunch of government communities that are starting to pop up of um, implementers and, and integrators and people who do this stuff every day starting to share their knowledge and experience within government and, and um, external to government as well, which is uh, quite exciting. So there's quite a complex but quite an uh, exciting landscape. Um, of all of these policies and initiatives, um, of the five state and territory data portals, and I mean just straight data, not specialist data, as, uh, you know, there's the, um, so SLIP is a specialist spatial data project, but data.newsouthwales, data.vic, data.queensland, data.southaustralia, data.act, and then um, data.gov.au are the six that I know of. Um, of those, um, data.gov.au originally was launched in 2009, and data.vic was originally launched in 2010. Both have been relaunched quite recently, and the other four have been launched literally in the last 12 months. So it's actually, there's a lot happening right now. There's a lot of those policies were only developed in the last couple of years, although a number of them originally came from the Gov2.0 policy from a couple of years ago, from 2009. And um, so, so a lot is happening right now, and this year is going to be quite epic for this space, and I'll, I'll get to that now. But 
The policy landscape at the federal level at the moment is largely, of course, um, being driven by uh, the new government that's just been elected. So there's the coalition's policy for e-government and the digital economy, which you'll see up here on the left, uh, which is well worth the read. It was launched uh, five days before the election, uh, on the, I think on the Monday. It was launched by the Minister for, uh, now Minister for Communications and Minister for Finance, uh, because it's sort of very much related to those two portfolios. And the reason for that is communications, of course, is the new name for Department of Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy. Um, Department of Finance, uh, which is actually where I work, is a very badly named department because people think of it as finance, but it's not just finance, it's basically the department of the whole of government. So anything that has anything to do with whole of government, uh, Department of Finance looks after everything from services delivery, such as networks and uh, um, content management systems and all kinds of other um, uh, uh, telepresence systems, those kind of things, right through to procurement, right through to contracts management, you know, lots and lots of stuff. So those two portfolios, and if you read that, the key things that comes out of that policy is a huge commitment to opening up more data, a huge commitment to the digitization of government. So every service or transaction that happens more than 50,000 times a year is supposed to be digitized by the year 2017. And as technical people, you will immediately have an understanding of just how exciting an opportunity that is, because the sort of infrastructure that needs to be put into place to do that sort of digitization is really cool. If you want to see a really good example of how that's been done in another jurisdiction, have a look at the um, GDS, the Government Digital Service in the UK. Um, the CTO over there, Liam Maxwell, is also um, was only over here a couple of months ago giving um, some talks about it, but we've got a f well, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of good conversations happening uh, with them, but the way they've done it is they picked out what were the top 20 digital transactions in the UK and then went about digitising them um, by creating a bit of elite squad of geeks who uh, work with industry and civil society and departments to come up with clever ways to actually digitise um, services and then uh, work with the departments to integrate it into business as usual and then move on to the next one. But it's all very transparent. You can see what's in beta, you can see what's live, you can see where things are up to, they blog about it con constantly. And so the whole thing, not just as a project about making it easier for citizens to help themselves, but it's being run in a very transparent and very, very interesting way from a project delivery and management perspective and a policy perspective. So that's the main policy to sort of be aware of at the moment and I highly recommend you read it. It also talks a lot about um, uh, cloud and shared services and trying to actually you know, improve efficiencies and those kinds of things. Um, but the, the rest of the policy landscape is, is quite complex. So there's policies around, um, but, uh, and a lot of these policies came out of the Gov20 task force report, which is from 2009, which is also worth reading. But there's uh, open data policies, there's um, policies around transforming how the public service workforce works, around research, um, and uh, spatial data and, and lots and lots of stuff. Uh, there's also now a big data policy. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of what the APS policy or the federal government policy landscape looks like. At a state level, so New South Wales government now has their Open Gov New South Wales um, policy and website. Um, all, every state and territory almost um, has a ICT strategy and a lot of those ICT strategies have been renewed very much so in the last year or two. And a lot of those ICT strategies talk about open data, talk about service delivery, talk about ways to actually get um, more personalisation of how citizens can engage with government, which is quite exciting. So New South Wales government have done a lot of work in this space. Um, the Queensland government launched their new platform. They've also got a minister for e-government and they're doing a lot of work around digitisation of services as well and have done a lot of publishing of data, including crime statistics and such as well. Um, also, um, well, I'll come back to that. Um, ACT have done a lot of work in this space. Uh, Victoria have got, done a lot of work going back, um, right back to 2010. So they've got um, a, a lot of advantage in the, in the um, from what they've done before. And South Australian government actually released a declaration of open data, which is quite exciting. And a lot of these initiatives have been done with open public consultation, um, open consultation on the development of their strategies or the development of their policies, uh, which is, you know, all in itself quite exciting. Um, some of these policy components, so as I said, very services and data heavy, um, and very much focused on, you know, A, creating a better public service, and um, B, sort of facilitating innovation in the true sense of the word, not the fluffy sense of the word, and, uh, and then economic growth, I guess, which is very much a focus of um, the new federal government. So there's some aspects. Normally I don't do talks where there's lots of words on the slides. <laughs> the reason I've done it in this way for this talk is because this is up on SlideShare and I'm, I'm making it just available as a reference. So I'm not gonna go through everything that's on the slides, but it's all publicly available for you to go through a little bit later at, in your discretion. So state of the nation, I'm gonna, I'm gonna browse through this fairly fast, but don't panic, it's all publicly available. Um, the, and I just want to really reiterate those three pillars 
of open government in a digital age of Gov 2.0, uh, the new sort of, well not that new, but buzzword for this space, is um, the idea that all of these things actually depend on each other. Open data helps feed into better policy outcomes and better analysis and better research and, and better, more efficient government, rather than four departments all collecting the same data, which may get slightly different outcomes, slightly different policies and all the rest of it. You actually get the sharing of data across government um, in a lot better way. Um, so better data and better use of data within government actually feeds into better services and better um, policy development. Uh, better policy engagement and, and public consultation feeds into better policy outcomes, feeds into better services, feeds into better data. Uh, you can start to crowdsource some of your data and get more better quality data. Um, and of course, better services, better citizen services, again, contributes to better data, contributes to better policy. So they're all very much interlinked. And um, so when people tend to focus on just one to the exclusion of others, uh, they don't tend to get the full package, the full um, advantage from this space. So the concept of open by design, has anyone heard of the concept of government as an API? A couple. Who, does anyone, uh, who knows what an API is? Yeah, most of the people. So for the others, an API is a, is a programmatic interface, effectively, um, to, a, to an application. So the idea is, um, the, the idea of government as, as an API, Ooh, can I draw? No, I won't, I won't get into drawing, otherwise it'll just be bad. I'll start doing ponies. Um, so the idea of government as an API is that you have um, your data and your services available programmatically so that your department can deliver your services in a way that suits your business need, but at the same time, someone else or even another department or even your premier's department or your um, prime minister and cabinet department can actually say, okay, well, let's take the... Um, let's say that the data stream or the services stream and let's take all the ones that are related to health and pull them together into one service. So now a person can say, okay, I just want to put my postcode in and understand all the services that are available in health through the one place. Because they don't want to have to go to this department then to that department and understand the intricacies of the structure of government which changes all the time anyway um, and, uh, and no one should be expected. Most people in government don't understand how government's structured half the time. So trying to expect a citizen to understand that complexity to find whatever it is they're trying to look for is, is ridiculous. But unfortunately a lot of people get very protective of their brand. People love the concept of, of citizen-centric services, making services that really support the people until you tell them that their, their logo is not going to be used. Yeah, because but we spend a whole bunch of money on a consultant to come in and tell us how to pronounce our brand in a better way and to, to build this very pretty logo. And we've got this new website we just set up. Um, and so it, it, it's, there's going to be a lot of culture change to lead to this, but the concept of citizen-centric services, true services that, that actually deliver what people need, uh, is going to take a lot of, um, a lot of work. So government, seeing government as an API is going to be a, a core principle to making this work. Because when you deliver a service, if part of the delivery of that service is part of the tender, part of the procuring process, part of the development process, is to make sure that behind whatever it is that you're delivering, other people can tap into the, to the service API or to the data API, then you, start, you can start doing some very clever things with it. So building open publishing or reporting or APIs into what you're doing, into your systems, into your processes, your procurement planning, basically into your business as usual, is the only way to make this stuff sustainable. If open government or open data or open APIs or citizen-centric services is an afterthought, then it will always be expensive and it will always be hard and it will always be retrospective and, and retro, um, I guess reactive rather than proactive. Um, so you need ways to be able to leverage all the government data, data and services through this uh, API approach. Lots of new and old skills um, being required and people are struggling a lot with this. Um, in, in the first instance, there's a lot of people who go, oh, this is very, very shiny, we can use Twitter to do something. Um, and of course that's rather disturbing because then they've got someone who doesn't necessarily apply some of the rigour of maybe some of the old ways of doing things, but at the same time they've got some new inputs that are coming in and don't necessarily know how to deal with that either. Um, I mean, you know, do you, do you need to log all of the tweets of your official department's Twitter account? And the answer is yes. Um, so in the last um, machinery of government change um, after the last election, I actually wrote some of the specifications, some of the advice to federal government agencies to say, please do not delete your Twitter account. Don't delete it. <laughs> if, you're, if, you, if it changes name, change the name, or maybe um, or park it, or you know, make, it, make it silent and, and hidden if you need to, but just don't delete it. And of course, three or four departments immediately deleted their, their account, and um, it immediately was picked up by someone else, and there was all kinds of shenanigans going on. And, you know, and that, that's fine, that's, you know, that's uh, you know, the, the freedom of people being able to use this stuff for whatever they want in some ways, but, um, but it's not very helpful when a, a Twitter account that looks vaguely official 
um, that people might actually look to for some official word starts putting out all kinds of weird stuff. Um, so th there's a lot of skills that, that are required in this space and a, and a bit of balance that needs to be found. And a lot of departments and jurisdictions are, are struggling with this space quite, quite strongly. So um, there's a lot of challenges. Um, some of the legislative challenges, uh, particularly around um, around the sharing of data, around how to how to actually put the services together in a way that doesn't um, contravene requirements around um, privacy, around um, around sharing, around um, servicing uh, the requirements of the, the community. There's a lot of cultural challenges, of course, the concept of actually collaborating. I mean, I've had people call up and by chance come through to me and say, yeah, so we're, we're looking at um, possibly creating a new data policy for government. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> well, come and sit down. Let me tell you about what's, where we're at. And, and you know, there's, just, there's not that natural um, inclination to consult or to um, collaborate even within government. So trying to actually get internal collaboration going, trying to leverage the geeks we have within government and not always look external is, is the other part, you know, end of that spectrum. And trying to find a middle path somewhere that we can leverage the skills that we have both internal and external to actually get the best outcome um, for the citizen as opposed to the best outcome for the KPIs that we've randomly set up because a you know, number of followers on Twitter is obviously a KPI that means something. Um, a lot of problems with existing um, legacy systems, and people use that as an excuse quite often. Oh, I'm sorry, the system, you know, the software can't do that, my biggest bugbear. By definition, software can do whatever you want it to do, actually. So let's figure out ways to actually overcome the concept that this is what the vendor said we can do, and, that this, and thus this is what we're limited to, and start saying, well, how can we actually um, see all the systems as back end? and start looking at ways to actually tie things together in the front end. That's, you know, having that plumbing in the middle is very useful. There's a low tolerance for mistakes, of course. Anytime anything goes even slightly wrong or even indeed is just misinterpreted, um, the media, the Twitterati, the, you know, everyone jumps on the back of public servants. The amount of people that call, tweet, SMS, um, Facebook, everything you can imagine me and tell me to go and fix every problem in the government is just hilarious. Um, you know, so there is a low tolerance for mistakes and that translates through to a low tolerance for investing money in the potent, something that might potentially be a mistake. Um, so there, there's, you know, there's some challenges there, reactive versus proactive, you know, a bunch of challenges. My favourite challenge though is over here on the right hand side. Um, people are very excited about big data and about what that can do for government and what that can do for services delivery and what that can do for citizens. Um, and I keep having to say to people, well, whether you're talking about open data, big data or linked data, you actually need data. So let's how about, how about we start with publishing some stuff? You know, what have you got? How can we publish that in a better way? Let's actually start publishing the stuff that we have access to right now, and, um, and then maybe we can start getting some of the benefits of it. But jumping straight to the idea of let's do some data visualization. Data visualization can be very, very useful from a communications perspective, from an analysis perspective, from a, um, informing the public and getting people engaged in data perspective. But if you don't have the data, you can't visualize it. So very quickly, and again, this is mostly for reference, but there's a lot of stuff happening with data.gov.au, uh, which is very exciting. The big change, though, that I've seen, particularly over the last 12 months, is that the shift in thinking has moved from data, or open government indeed, as a benefit for the citizen, which, by the way, it sounds great from a citizen's perspective, but it will never have a budget line for a government department. It will never have resources allocated to it specifically because in a time where everyone's being asked to reduce their resources and to reduce their footprint and to actually, you know, to lean up and, and be very efficient and effective, um, it's very, very hard to say, well, this is a public good and so we need to just do this because it's a good thing for the public. Um, that doesn't mean it's not a public good, it just means it's hard to be sustainable. So one of the things that started to happen is people are starting to look at what are the benefits to the public service? Because if you can actually create a more efficient and effective and... Um, useful um, services from the, from the public service, then that is something that you can measure, that is something that can be, um, you know, uh, budgeted against. So um, I'll come to that actually now, but so there's all the benefits of community, and this is mostly around open data, but it's broader to open government I think as well. So there's the benefits of transparency, you know, that visibility to government spending and projects and effectiveness generally puts a subtle pressure to deliver your projects well, which is kind of nice. Um, and it also builds people's um, engagement in those projects. When you, in the old days, you used to announce a policy, take two or three or five, whatever it is, however many years to deliver it, and then, and with just silence, and then at the very end, basically do a mission accomplished press release, right? That is the old way. But the problem is now people hear about the policy and then immediately a void is created. And if you don't fill that void with updates and with information and with communication, then the void gets filled by other people. 
um, particularly in the case where it might get filled by other people a couple of weeks before you're about to announce mission accomplished. So you need to actually be communicating an ongoing level of progress in order to keep people engaged, in order to keep trust high, because public support of and engagement of your policies ends up being one of the, the main factors to, to success in today's day and age in a lot of ways. So it increases incentive to follow an evidence-based approach. It builds trust in government services and information. Participatory democracy, um, greater participation in planning, decision-making and implementation of policy. A more informed public leads to hopefully better decision-making and hopefully better discussions and debates, you would hope. Improvements to data leads to better policy. I remember having one department say to me, oh, we don't want to release our data because, first of all, we've got 29 different definitions of the word income um, and, um, and, you know, and there's mistakes in it. I said, well, doesn't it bother you that you're currently making decisions on bad data? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe this is a bigger problem than how bad it'll be if it gets out there in the public. Um, innovation, opportunities for innovation in industry, research, civil society, you know, there's always cool things that people can do with the data, uh, both from a public good perspective or an economic good perspective. And then, of course, there's the economic um, argument, of which there is plenty of evidence to back up all of these, which I can distribute later. But then there's the benefits to government, which, and here's how it gets um, uh, really important from a sustainability in the business as usual implementation of this stuff as opposed to just being a fringe thing that some enthusiast in the government department is doing. So it helps cut red tape, which is very popular at the moment, as you can imagine. So more efficient to share data across government and with the public. The effort it takes to share data from one department to another, you have an MO, uh, memorandum of understanding in place, you have someone to manage the relationship, you have the cleaning up of data to uh, comply with the legislative requirements around privacy and, and um, the identification of data across um, departments. The amount of effort it takes to take that same data and make it publicly available is in some cases minutely more, in some cases slightly less, and it certainly doesn't have the ongoing relationship management that you have when you have a unilateral relationship between two departments to share data. So the sharing data publicly ends up being a far more efficient and effective way, in a lot of cases, not all, in a lot of cases, to actually share data across whole of government and get better outcomes, um, which means less paying for the same data twice or multiple times. So proactive automated publishing can also help where you have to publish data anyway. If you can publish it automatically, then you save the, you know, maybe two hours a month or maybe ten hours a month that it currently takes to actually do, um, to do the publishing of your data. Improves government operations. So enables collaboration and consistency across government and with the public. Improves policy analysis. The government is an API approach that I've spoken about. Data quality, um, opportunities for evidence-based and iterative policy. And iterative policy is, weirdly enough, a very new thing for a lot of people in government. The concept of um, constantly monitoring and improving your policy in the same way that we do with release early, release often. So I mean a lot of the concepts that we've been following forever in the tech sector and certainly in the free software sector um, are, are starting to infiltrate. I mean I actually had someone say to me the other day, oh these code improvements you're looking at for data.gov.au, you will open source them, won't you? Because that's very important. And I, I just, yeah, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll open source it. That's, of course I'm going to open source it. Anyway, but the fact that people are asking me that now is, is very, very interesting. And innovation, and this is actually important. A lot of people have the perspective that innovation can't happen in government, which I, I think is actually very wrong. When there is a lot of pressure to deliver services and there's shrinking budgets and all those kinds of things, actually there's a lot of pressure to innovate and to change the way that we do things. So, um, so opening stuff up actually helps us to tap into public and private innovation, helps government to change the culture of what it means and what it costs, greater capacity for public contributions, but also a greater capacity for collaboration across departments as well. And you can start to say, well, um, these four departments all have expertise in X, Y, and Z. Why wouldn't we put them together as a bit of a project team to deliver something which actually would be beneficial to a whole of government? There's a lot of stuff around privacy and confidentiality to be taken into account, but there's also a lot of ways to deal with that, which are very effective and are very tr um, tried and tested. There's loads of tools available and loads of skilled people out there, um, although it is growing very rapidly. And in fact, several of the universities are really getting into this space. Griffith University is... is amazing um, up in Queensland. They have um, an entire course now around data uh, publishing, data analytics, data visualisation, analysis, and, um, and a whole, you know, thousands of new students being turned out who are really great in this space. So if you go to that university and say, we want to do a project and look at how we can better use the data that we have or better, or better engage with the public or deliver a better service, you can do that. So there's, um, there's a lot of skills out there and a lot of people interested in this space. But the greatest opportunity is the hacker culture in Australia. And of course, I use the term hacker in the traditional sense of the word. Um, so this concept of doing creative and clever things with technology as opposed to breaking into things, those people are called crackers. So hacker culture in Australia is really strong. We have a really fantastic developer community. We have a great um, 
uh, developer ethos. Um, I actually kicked off, uh, which goes to the next slide, I guess. I actually kicked off GovHack again in um, a couple of years ago. The first one was in 2009. Uh, run um, uh, by uh, John Alsop, um, and then we, we started it again uh, just two years ago. And two years ago, we had I don't know, 130 people in two cities. Last year, we had uh, about 1,000 people across eight cities. And this year, we're looking at probably having about two or 3,000 people across uh, probably 15 cities uh, around Australia, all working on government data, all creating amazing outcomes. Uh, last year, we had 130 projects they were all based around you know, better service delivery, better analysis, you know, using government data to do really clever things. So this community who loves to hack for the fun of it, uh, who loves to do clever creative things, and if it's meaningful and if it will actually contribute to a better society, we'll, we'll just create the most amazing thing. So tapping into this and engaging you know, respectfully and, and, um, and positively and with meaning with this community is, is a really useful opportunity for government, particularly in a time of increasing fiscal and other constraints. So, um, so basically we have all the pieces in place. Uh, the state of the nation is very exciting. We basically have a lot of change happening very quickly. The stars are very well aligned from a policy perspective, from a technology perspective, from a skills perspective, from a tools perspective, you know, uh, from even from a political perspective, if you want to go that far. And, um, and you know, generally speaking, we have the technology. So uh, what better place than here? What better time than now? I always like to finish with a little bit of Rage Against the Machine. Um, any questions before we kick off with the rest of it? Sulet. Yeah. Um, no, this isn't about surveillance. No. <laughs> So the question is about um, uh, about trade agreements and about whether the citizenry could put pressure to make those processes more transparent and open, and whether any of these kinds of mechanisms could help with that. Uh, just for the recording, and um, and the answer is it, it's really interesting. The main things that government affects society are through a, a number of different types of processes. There's laws that usually come in through either legislation or, or judicial processes through the legal mechanisms. Um, there's, um, so there's laws and regulations that come in. There's leg uh, and that's a reasonably transparent process and, and goes through the judicial system. There's the parliamentary processes, um, which create legislation and, and those kinds of things, which again is reasonably transparent, reasonably um, um, you know, open, um, and in fact, we have one of the most open democracies in the world. We all get very annoyed <laughs> and want things to be better and better and better, but compared to around the world, I mean, some, there are some countries that have no public record of what's happening in their parliaments or the decisions or, or no freedom of information, and they're actually rolling back in some cases. Um, but trade agreements and international agreements that are developed in secret, there's no oversight, um, arguably. There's no um, way for a citizen to participate when it's done in secret. So TPP, ACTA, the US Free Trade Agreement, these are all good examples where there, there's um, arguably a, a, a good case to be made to make them more open and, and transparent and more engaged. And the funny thing is that people that say, oh, no, they have to be done in secret because um, that's the only way that you can get a good outcome, and, um, is, you know, and that is one of the arguments that's made. Um, generally, the, my response to that is, well, New Zealand managed to open this up fairly well, and they actually uh, decided to be a lot more engaging with their general public, which gave the New Zealand government a stronger foot to stand on in actually saying, I'm sorry, but this would be bad for our country, and we know that because we spoke to our people. Uh, so I think that there is an argument to say um, engaging the public in the decisions that affect the public can actually help you get better evidence-based outcomes. The US Free Trade Agreement arguably had very little benefit to the Australian economy, and there's been a lot of papers around that, and I recommend people go and check the excellent work by Kim Weatherill on this space, in this space. But, um, and yet, we've still seen the signing of ACTA, and we're still seeing the signing of TPP, um, which, you know, which, which mimic um, a lot of those same um, ideas without any evidence that they've actually helped us at all. So um, it's, it's very, very interesting. And that's probably all I can say on that topic. <laughs> Anyone else we had down here? So the question is about um, open data um, 
you know, being understood to help with policy outcomes, but whether there's much of a movement around the benefits from an accountability and transparency perspective. Generally open data around the world um, falls into three categories of how it's seen and thus what the implementation of policy looks like around open data. The first one's transparency and accountability. That's been one of the strongest pushes in a lot of ways of the UK government, um, to a lesser degree in the US, but the UK government has very much pushed the transparency you know, argument and agenda. The second one is around economic good and, and value adding and, and you know, what's um, industry basically being able to build on what is effectively a publicly developed and publicly funded data set or information set, which should be by making it publicly available, then, then you actually get a, a net economic benefit to the, to the nation, effectively. Um, that argument is very much one that's favoured by um, the current federal government, and, um, and there's a lot of evidence around that. Um, and then the third one is usually around the concept of improving government. Um, uh, so I think, maybe I've just confused that. Oh, I think that's the third one. Um, but the, the concept of um, a better civic engagement in, in the process actually ends up with better government. Now, um, so the accountability argument is not one that's really strongly focused on in Australia at this point, but it ends up being an outcome anyway. Um, there's, there's been a few cases now where um, you know, a statement's come out and because the data that underpinned that statement was publicly available, people were able to then go and verify. But we need to see a cultural change also in the community where rather than just believing what's written by whichever media organisation or whatever paper that you read, you get an instinct of saying, oh, but, but what does the data say? But you need the data to be published to do that. So there's, there's a sort of a bit of a cultural change from a publisher's perspective but also from a consumer's perspective to actually go and investigate the things. Um, but yeah, the, the accountability and transparency benefits, I think, can be very useful in a lot of aspects, but it's certainly, I don't think, one of the biggest focuses in Australia at the moment. The biggest focus is around efficient and effective government and um, um, uh, economic benefit, which is fine. Standards. So the question is whether there's a policy around open format um, or, um, or what software people have to use. And are you talking with open data specifically? No. Just anything. Okay, so basically there are some standards that are set in government. And um, in fact, um, it, most of the standards for federal government are actually set by um, one of the teams within Department of Finance that, um, that I used to work with. Um, but. Um, but a lot of how technology is implemented within agencies, at a federal level at least, is um, relatively uh, autonomous. They tend to implement it their own way, um, but have to follow a couple of standards that are set across government. Um, generally speaking, the policy around standards is that you should use standards that have been ISO approved effectively. And of course, that has its own bag of uh, worms uh, to open up. But, um, but, um, but generally speaking, people are not dictated to as to what software to use. Um, with some standards they are, and with some standards they're not. But I will just throw this little thing out there. I've heard a lot of people say open data has to be released in open format. The problem is that in a lot of cases the data isn't stored in an open format. The software that's used isn't an open standard based piece of software. So um, my recommendation to agencies as a person that's doing open data is in the first case just release it in whatever you've got. In the second case let's look at your systems and figure out how to automate the publishing of it in a better format. Um, but it has to be automated because if, if it's always retrospective, it takes too much time, it's very inefficient, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, um, and then when you can put those automation systems into place, then you know, other people can do the format changing. Other, you, know, you can start to get um, a lot of other stuff happening. But yeah, the answer is there's not a clear policy at the moment around that at a federal level. In some of the states there is. Uh, some of the states ask specifically that data be published in an open format, for instance, and then they define open format. Yeah? Yeah, I work in construction. Yeah. No, well, that's not the case always. Um, I mean, maybe it's the case for some projects, but certainly not always that I've seen. Um, uh, let's talk about that one a little bit more. But generally speaking, that there's not. There, there are some cases where there's stuff specified, and some cases where there's not. There are very clear procurement rules that says that you're not supposed to um, define a particular 
product. You're supposed to have an open market approach to procurement. And this is actually the reason I went to work for the department that does whole of government procurement. Weirdly enough, a lot of people think that sounds like the most boring thing in the world. And that's cool. Um, but if you don't get your procurement policy right, then that affects everything else. Because what you can use is determined upon what you can buy and how you can buy it. But there is a policy in the federal government now that says that every tender is supposed to ask the tenderer what um, open source they've considered as part of their response. Now, are they all compliant all the time? Actually, no, um, but it is actually monitored and, those pe and departments are reminded to do it and it has actually started to change the perspective around you know, the possibility of using more broad spectrum of, of products. It's not to say that the open source product is always going to be the best one, but considering it is important and actually to having an equal playing field in what technologies can best support whatever it is you're trying to do. Okay, one more, and then we should move on. presupposes that politicians and political parties think that evidence-based policy is a good thing, and without it all wanting to politicise it um, on party lines, are we convinced that that's actually true, first of all, or are political parties and politicians far more interested in being reactive to polling data, where they do like data? Um, and if not, then how do we actually ensure that we sure. set up government so that it is largely evidence-based? and therefore we leverage all of this cool stuff that we do. I should have just circulated the microphone. So the question is, for the recording, is around um, basically whether, because of the politicisation, well, the, in some cases, potential for politicisation of decision making, whether evidence-based policy is, is something people actually want, um, and in any case, how we would still imbue that regardless of what is wanted at the political level anyway. Lucky I'm apolitical, so it's going to be, so my answer is basically, this is where we differentiate between politics and public service. Um, when the public service is formulating a policy position for, con for consideration by a minister, um, doing that policy development and um, advice development for the minister openly and publicly, where possible, and it's not always possible, but where possible doing that openly and publicly, means that the advice that the department pulls together can be more evidence-based, can be given to the minister, and if the minister wants to go a different way for whatever reason, and sometimes those reasons might be perfectly you know, legitimate, they are after all our representatives and it is after all their call ultimately. The public service serves the politicians, um, serves the elected representatives of our democracy. Um, if they want to go another way, that's completely actually up to them. But in this way, by developing it in the public, then you know, it, it would be um, useful to explain why they went in a different way than the evidence-based approach. Yeah. Yeah, but I wouldn't tell everyone about that yet. No, no. Um, basically, yeah, evidence-based policy development, or at least the development of evidence-based policy uh, recommendations, is a very useful way to assisting in encouraging an evidence-based policy approach. Shall we say? How is that for diplomatic? Any other questions? You got uh, anyone else? Okay, let's jump over to the next session. I, I'm actually.